National identity is often formed in the midst of a crisis, and few tragedies have been so important to the identity of a nation than the Great Famine for Ireland. Between 1845 and 1851, the Great Famine, or Anne Gorta Moore in Gaelic, killed over a million people and drove just as many to seek new lives across the world. By the 1840s, Ireland was securely under British rule. The tide of nationalism that began on the European continent and the rise of the popular press had energised the nascent Irish nationalist movement, but London's control was reasonably certain. Ireland itself was a land of contrasts. Wealthy, developed urban areas like Belfast and Dublin were comparable to major British cities but millions still eked out difficult lives in the rural counties. The key to survival for this farming population was the potato. Potatoes were introduced from the Americas in the 16th century, and their extremely high yield per acre made them an excellent staple food source. By 1845, Ireland was growing 15 million tonnes of potatoes per year, and they provided most of the calorie intake for about 3 million people. Contrary to popular stereotypes, the Irish also grew many other crops like wheat, oats, barley and peas. But potatoes were far and away the most important crop for the country. Enter Phytophthora infestans, better known as potato blight. Originating in the potato's homeland of America, blight is a fungal infection that thrives in damp environments and causes infected crops to wither away into inedible black mush. It entered Europe early in the 1840s, where it ravaged potato crops in places like Belgium and Holland. However, when it reached the shores of Ireland in 1845, the effects would be apocalyptic. Blight ravaged the 1845 crop. This first blight was somewhat sporadic, and it took weeks for officials to realise the scale of the disaster. Overall, about 40% of the entire country's potato crop was ruined. The effect was particularly bad in the eastern, southern and central regions of Ireland, with many counties reporting that the vast majority of the potatoes were lost. Ireland had faced famines before. There had been one between 1800 and 1801, and another from 1816 to 1818. But this crisis would be another beast entirely. Action was clearly needed, and this responsibility fell upon the British government. However, in order to understand how the British responded, we need to cover a few things. First is that the British government at the time was almost religiously devoted to the principles of laissez-faire and free trade. This belief held that the unrestrained independent action of people in the market would allocate resources more effectively than any central government could. The British would cling to this belief throughout the famine years. Secondly, the British, or more specifically the English, had particular beliefs about the racial character of the Irish as lazy, unproductive and irrational. This explained the relative economic and social backwardness of Ireland and justified British rule, as the English were simply civilising those they saw as inferior. Anti-Catholic sentiment also played a role in painting the Irish as an unreliable and untrustworthy people. Thirdly, related to the previous two, was a strong belief in self-reliance. The old pull-yourself-up-by-your-bootstraps attitude discouraged the British government from providing aid to people in need out of fear of making them dependent. Far better, they argued, for those in hard times to learn to look after themselves than for the government to incentivise people to be lazy. All three of these attitudes would come into play as the British government was forced to respond to the famine. Following the disastrous crop failure in 1845, the Tory government under Sir Robert Peel organised shipments of food into Ireland to provide short-term relief. Indian cornmeal was shipped in and distributed to some of the worst hit areas by November 1845. While the impotent poor, the elderly and children could receive these rations for free, the British commitment to self-reliance meant that able-bodied adults were usually required to participate in public works projects, like stone breaking and road building, to qualify for support. 
This food ration was famously unpleasant. The gruel made from it was nicknamed Peel's Brimstone. But miserable food was still food. Thanks to a combination of the food inputs and consumption of animals like pigs that couldn't be sustained without the potatoes to act as animal feed, mass starvation in late 1845 and early 1846 was avoided. However, summer 1846 brought new hurdles. 1846's crop had been even worse hit than the previous year. At least 75% of Ireland's potatoes was destroyed by blight, with some regions having effectively all of its crop destroyed. Meanwhile, in Britain, a new Whig government under Lord John Russell came to power. Russell appointed a man to oversee the famine response, whose name is perhaps as hated in Ireland as that of the potato blight itself, Charles Trevelyan. Trevelyan was a fierce devotee of laissez-faire and self-reliance. He was also a firm believer in divine providence and wrote to an Irish peer that, quote, the judgment of God sent the calamity to teach the Irish a lesson. Trevelyan's approach leaned into his economic principles. He restricted access to direct food aid while expanding public works programs in late 1846. His rationale was that giving the Irish people the chance to earn money to buy food would produce a healthier market and solve the crisis better than simply handing food out. Elsewhere, charity from overseas poured into Ireland as the scale of the crisis became clear. Britain, America, continental Europe and Australia, among other places, were generous donors to private and religious charity groups providing aid to the Irish. One of the best-remembered donations came from the Native American Choctaw Nation. They donated $170, about $5,000 in today's money. Not a large contribution, but a heartening show of support from a people who had themselves endured suffering and starvation on the Trail of Tears just a few years earlier. Groups like the Quakers set up soup kitchens and food distribution centers, but no private group could ever hope to help more than a fraction of the millions of vulnerable Irish people. 1847 was the critical year for the famine. The poor harvest of 1846 had a cumulative effect as people were reduced to eating their seed potatoes and farmers were terrified of planting another field of potatoes only to see it consumed by the blight. The prospects for the 1847 harvest looked bleak. As food stores ran dry and harvests continued to fail, the scale of the suffering increased. Entire villages were depopulated as their crops failed and they lacked the resources or simply the energy to escape the less affected areas. Mass graves across Ireland attest to the scale of the death where entire communities died alongside each other in a matter of days as malnourishment, infections and diseases struck down people in the thousands. Those who didn't starve to death fled to the cities or the less afflicted rural areas, such as Northern Ireland. Disease became a rampant problem as starving people's immune systems broke down and the flood of refugees crowding in cities, workhouses and food distribution centres became perfect vectors for devastating illness. Measles, tuberculosis, cholera, typhus and typhoid fever claimed thousands of lives and were responsible for the vast majority of deaths during the famine period. One option for desperate people was the workhouse, which provided shelter and food in exchange for work. Ireland's workhouse capacity in March 1847 was estimated at 115,000 maximum, well below what it needed to handle the desperation of the famine. For example, the Fermoy workhouse in County Cork was designed for 800 people, but by 1847 it housed as many as 1,800 at any one time. As a result, the death rates in workhouses were terrifyingly high. In the early years of the famine, weekly death rates in the workhouses were as much as 25 per 1,000 people. They became places of last resort, or even a final destination, for those who knew they'd die. After all, the workhouses promised all occupants a coffin and a burial at public expense, which was all that some people could hope for. Emergency expansion to accommodation and the construction of fever hospitals in late 1847 and 1848 
massively improved the mortality rate in workhouses, but many thousands would still die in their halls. Another option to escape the famine was emigration. An estimated one million Irish people emigrated from Ireland during the famine years, most of them going to the United States or to Britain, but Canada, Australia and New Zealand all had their fair share of Irish migrants too. However, emigration was no guarantee that one would escape suffering. The tightly packed ships were hotbeds of disease and poor living conditions that earned them the nickname of coffin ships. Even if they made it to their destination, the Irish often faced harsh treatment and discrimination. For example, Irish immigrants to Quebec were sent to Grosse Isle Immigration Depot, where appalling living conditions killed about 3,000 new immigrants during the time of the famine. Meanwhile, Trevelyan's tight-fisted relief programs were ongoing. By March 1847, his Board of Works was the largest employer in Ireland, with 700,000 people on its payroll. However, low pay meant that most of those people still had to hope to grow more food of their own or receive food relief in order to survive. By early 1847, though, even the British government realised this wasn't enough and finally set up soup kitchens to properly feed people. For all the criticism of British policy, these soup kitchens were a remarkable success and at their height they were feeding 3 million people a day. On the surface, things might have seemed to be looking up when the blight spared the 1847 potato crop. Unfortunately, two years of terrible harvests and the consumption of seed potatoes by desperate farmers in 1846 meant this was not the saving grace it could have been. The amount of acreage of potatoes planted in 1847 was one-ninth of what had been planted in 1845, which meant that even without the blight, the amount of potatoes was little better, if not lower, than the 1845 harvest. For outside observers, though, this was proof that the famine had run its course. Trevelyan and the government came to believe that the worst of the famine had passed and the Irish should go back to looking after themselves as soon as possible. In September 1847, the government soup kitchens were abruptly closed and international donations dried up as sympathy waned and reports of the Blight's passage assured many that the crisis was over. This was not to be. A damp summer in 1848 brought the Blight back with a vengeance, and poor wheat harvests in the late 1840s didn't help matters either. One of the worst contributors to the suffering of the famine were landlords. Hundreds of thousands of Irish people depended upon rented land to grow their crops and paid their rates in either cash or kind. When those crops failed, they could not cover their rates and faced potential eviction from their land. Between 1846 and 1854, 500,000 people were evicted in Ireland in such circumstances. These clearances left an indelible mark on the survivors and etched a permanent hostility to landlords into later Irish culture. Landlords were especially important for the famine response after 1847, after the British came to insist that Ireland support its own poor relief programmes. Therefore, the tax burden for supporting the poor fell upon the landlords who weren't eager to pay. Many exploited the so-called Gregory Clause, which exempted anyone with more than one quarter acre of land from receiving poor relief. Landlords often demanded that tenants turn over their land to them in exchange for this relief, sometimes demanding all of their land before they'd lift a finger to help their tenants. Landlords earned a bitter reputation for their action during the famine. Even the British blamed their greed and responsibility for causing the famine. The Times called the Irish landlords things which disgrace Ireland and disgust Christendom. But whether this British response was honest outrage or deflection of blame is an open question. Still, the British government did nothing to stop evictions. Trevelyan even stressed the importance of not interfering and trusting the market to naturally sort things out. Of all the factors in the famine, none has caused such enduring controversy as food exports. Put simply, Ireland continued to export food, mostly to Britain during the famine years. Wheat, oats, butter, beans, peas, barley, 
cattle, eggs and more from Irish farms and fields ended up in foreign households while the Irish themselves starved. The exporting of food from Ireland has become a huge part of retellings of the famine and been the subject of much academic debate. It's often been repeated that Ireland was a net exporter of food during the famine and that the entire thing could have been avoided if not for British exports. The 19th century nationalist John Mitchell was one of many early advocates of this belief, writing on one occasion that Ireland had been producing ample provision for double her own population, and elsewhere claiming that a government ship sailing into any harbour with Indian corn was sure to meet half a dozen sailing out with Irish wheat and cattle. The image of starving Ireland watching as British ships laden with Irish food sailed for British ports is an enduring one that dominates popular history of the famine. However, the reality was not so simple. Historians like James Donnelly Jr. have analysed the exports and imports of Ireland during this period and argue strongly against this image of events. Firstly, exports of important food crops from Ireland dropped sharply during the famine. For example, exports of grain fell by about 75% between 1844 and 1847, not to mention potatoes. While exports of some foods like honey, salmon and butter rose, these were a comparatively small percentage of overall Irish food exports. Secondly, the amount of food imported to Ireland during the famine was considerably higher than the amount exported. In 1847 and 1848, Ireland imported a net total of 868,000 tonnes of grain. In calorie terms, Donnelly calculated that the value of Irish food imports was triple that of exports, on average, through the second half of the 1840s. Attempts to treat exports and imports on the whole have been further criticised for ignoring details within the data. For example, the regions of Ireland which were exporting food were not necessarily the ones hit by famine, and crudely labelling everything as forced British exports obscures the reality that these exports were usually the result of private transactions. For some Irish people, such as those in the cattle industry or those working in the shipyards, exports were their source of income and the means by which they survived the famine. Ultimately, Donnelly and other historians have concluded that all of Ireland's food exports combined would not have compensated for the food deficiency on its own. Still, assuming that all of the exported food could have been efficiently distributed for human consumption at home, as much as 15% of Ireland's calorie intake could have been covered. Whether that was practical or not is another matter, but even a small part of that 15% could have translated to many potential lives saved. But Trevelyan and the British government refused to intervene. Although he was urged to halt all food exports, Trevelyan stated that doing so would not do even any immediate good, and he argued that the disruption to food prices would inflict a permanent injury on the country. The famine receded in the early 1850s. A gradual recession of the potato blight ended the risk to the food supply, but the island that emerged from the famine was radically changed. Before 1845, Ireland was home to over 8 million people. By 1851, that had fallen to a little over 6 million. An estimated 1 million people perished from starvation, diseases or other famine-related causes in Ireland. Another million or more emigrated where they founded Ireland's massive global overseas community. Blame for the famine has been laid at the feet of various culprits. The potato blight itself, obviously, but landlords, merchants, Trevelyan and the British government at large contributed to the famine. Some people, like the historian A.J.P. Taylor and journalist Tim Pat Coogan, have dubbed the famine a genocide. But most modern scholars don't believe that the British had any intent to kill the Irish through their policies. Trevelyan and the others had a sincere but misguided belief in the power of markets. But their inaction to prevent evictions or exports, and their eagerness to suspend the soup kitchens when they mistakenly believed the famine was over, definitely exacerbated the famine and contributed to the deaths of thousands. But what do you think? Are the British to blame for the famine? Let us know what you think in the comments 
and don't forget to leave a like on this video or subscribe for more videos like this.